All right, good morning, everyone. Um, what we're going to be going through today is basic uh, M2C6, Ripro C6, uh, like installations and things like that. All right. Okay, so we've got some uh, intricate questions right here. And we will go through and try to explain these as we go. So I'm going to keep this question in my little question box over here uh, until towards the end, because I think I can touch down on all the different aspects of this question here. Thank you, Randy. All right, so what we're going to do next is I'm going to get this software loaded. Um, I'm going to do a update process and a little bit of everything, so that way everybody uh, can be on the same page. All right, so I just plugged in my software key. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, <clears throat> go through the installation process or the uninstall process, so that way I can get to the most current build. A lot of people have had this software for a while now, uh, and sometimes every couple months or if you start having issues, uh, if you start having issues and stuff, definitely call into the support department first. And, but if not, then we can go through this process and uh, get you to the most up-to-date builds and drivers and things like that. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the uninstall process. I am using Windows 10. It is compatible with Windows 10 and uh, below. Um, cool thing about Windows 10 is if you want to get to something, you can just start typing it. So we're going to go to the control panel, if I can spell correctly. All right. And under control panel, um, if it comes up and does that little categories view or whatever, I can just switch to uh, large icons or small icons. So what I'm going to do is go to programs and features. And I'm going to find the DTG RIP Pro, and I'm going to remove it completely. All right. Completely uninstall here. All right, I'm just going to go to remove. Completely remove, yes. Uh, normally, I would restart the computer, uh, but since we're doing a webinar, I don't want to have to get everybody to log back in, so I'm just going to click no here. All right, make sure it's gone. I can always hit refresh. And now I do not have that in here. This is not a complete uninstall, right? It leaves a footprint on your hard drive, right? To get to that, click on my file locator, and then click on my C drive, which is this computer or uh, my computer, and then I can click on my C drive, which is my hard drive, right? And then I see this right here, my DTG Ripro uh, C6. If you have a lot of custom platens that you have already built and dialed in, you can save your media folder, all right? The media folder basically has all the different platens in it, okay? So if you've built custom ones or prefer the ones that you have, you can just basically make a copy of this and then paste it to like your desktop so that way it will, uh, you can paste it back into the new install so that way you can keep going. Okay, so let's just go ahead. I'm going to just remove this folder so I start from scratch here. So I'll just go to delete. Okay, so that is a fresh uninstall. I'll go ahead and get rid of my icon down here. I'll see if there's anything left in my apps. There's nothing under my D's here for uh, DTG. All right, and then I'll go ahead and empty my recycle bin. Okay, so to find the most up-to-date build of our software, it is always posted on our website. All right, to get to our website, you have the, let me go back to the home. All right, this is support.colbezi.com. There's a lot of useful information on here, so definitely when you have a second, go through this stuff. All right, so since we're dealing with DTG, and we're dealing with RIP Pro. I'm going to go down here to the RIP Pro settings. All right, 
So under RIPRA, you have some of the different levels of software that we've sold in the past. If you're not licensed for any of these, do not try to download it. They will not give you any kind of information or let you use it or anything like that. All right, but there's a lot of different information in here, like even holding errors, like if this pops up on you, uh, setting up your media, um, plugins, all these different things that you can go through. All right, so definitely when you have time, go through this stuff. The more you know, the better you'll get at using it. All right. And there's also installation instructions as well. All right. But normally I would click right here on my download. All right. It'll come up and it'll download a zip file. All right. So I can show you. It will download to my downloads. And it'll look like that. It's a zip folder. So what I do, I don't install it from the zip folder. I always like to extract it to, say, my desktop. Okay. Since this has already been extracted, because it does take a couple minutes for the download, depending on your internet speed, because it's a pretty large file, I have already downloaded it, and I have also extracted it to my desktop here. So then from here, I can double-click on my install folder, double-click to run setup. Depending on which language you want it, you can go through there. All right, so this is where to ask you to plug in your key. If you already have the software installed, it's already in your computer. Uh, if you're going to do this as a fresh installer, as you're a new, uh, a new user, make sure to have this little key. This little key right here is your software. All right, it will, you can open the software uh, or be in the software and unplug this key and then your software will not work. <laughs> it will not allow you to print, the buttons change positions, all kinds of stuff, all right? So this basically is your licensing for your software. Uh, if you need uh, RIP Pro on a separate computer, you can move the key with that computer, or you could order a uh, separate key. All right, and your uh, salesperson or your technician can let you know how much those cost and get you another one if needed. So just be real careful not to lose or damage this key. Uh, and just a, a bit of advice, don't put it on the front of your computer if you're if it's down underneath your desk so you don't take a chance in kicking it or something to that order. All right, so we're going to hit next here. Um, if it comes up and says uh, where to look for it, which it already kind of looked for mine, it knew where to get it from, but you would look for the CAD link uh, just so you can see it. Over here on my drives, I have the CAD link key. Under the Catalan key, it has my license files. All right, so I'll click on Next. I will accept my license agreement. If I do the complete install, I don't really change my directory folder or anything. Go Next. Then it goes through the install process. Depending on your computer speed, RAM and stuff is how long it takes. Okay, so once this finishes and everything, I do have some suggestions. Uh, since I've uh, come back to the Cold Desi uh, at the beginning of this year, I've started playing around with all the different print modes, uh, color profiles, and things like that to make it uh, the best quality prints uh, to go out. Um, there are certain print modes that you can choose from, but the ones that I prefer as of right now, and there is stuff still going on with development, uh, for color profiling, 
Um, but uh, I'll give you my suggestions and then you can work around from those. This shouldn't take 15 to 20 minutes, but depending on the fastness of your computer, uh, definitely uh, just let it finish its process. All right. And this is another spot where definitely I would restart the computer. Uh, but since we're in the webinar, I'll just go ahead and do it now. All right. So this is a step that I always like to go through before I do my uh, initial setup of my uh, software. I like to check to see if there's any manufacturer or software updates. So to get to that, you can go to all programs or all apps. Scroll down to your setting uh, where it says DTG Retro C6 M Series. And then I can click and check for updates. It'll bring up a separate little window right here. And I can check. I don't really have the update on my computer because I've never downloaded it. So I'll always check the manufacturer's website. Click on Next. Then it pops up my Update Wizard. The first button I click is Download File. All right. If there's no update available, it'll say no update available. If there is, it'll say downloading file from website. Let this just run. Um, if you click anywhere inside this window, it'll come up and say not responding. Trust me, it still is. Just let it finish its thing. All right. From here, what I'm looking for is a set of letters and numbers with a .exe behind it, because that'll be my update file name. And it'll make my finish button become active. It does take a few minutes for it to download the proper files, but uh, just be patient. But this ensures if there's anything new or anything like that from the actual uh, uh, programmer that it'll uh, automatically patch it for us. You can always check for this update at any time. So you can put a schedule on your, uh, your monthly calendar, uh, check for updates. Um, while this is downloading, uh, one of our um, employees here, Michael Georgievich from Cohen and Company, has a question for us. Yes, sir. Um, when, when you have a chance, mm -hmm. a gentleman down in the Keys mm -hmm. um, placed an order I can't explain, so I'd like you to help. When Excellent. You Not a problem. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Michael Georgievich is the director of Coleman and Company, our supply company. Uh, we all work here hand in hand, trying to uh, offer the best service to our clients. So we sit there and go back and forth with like new products and stuff like that to see if it's something that makes like the DTG process a lot easier. Okay, so now that the update file name has popped up in here and my finish button has come up, I just click on finish and then it starts the patching process. Pretty easy, just hit start. What this is patching is giving you the most up-to-date color profile. And just to give you a little explanation of what like color profiling is, uh, the programmer, what we do is print out spectrums of color and use a color spectrometer to scan those. And then it basically uses color theory saying this is the output that is being produced. We need to make adjustments to get to this color, what it should be. So it's ever growing and everything like that. So um, it's just one of those things you just have to kind of keep up with. So I'll go ahead and hit finish here. Update wizard is complete. So then I'll go back to my start menu again. And go. And what I want to do is make an icon for my um, RIP software so I don't have to keep going into this menu to get to this software. So what I can do is right click on the actual RIP Pro software here, and then I can pin it to my start menu so it's always up at the top, or I can go to more and pin to taskbar. It'll drop an icon dot right down here in the bottom. Since I use this a lot, I'm going to move it down here to the end. You notice I have my icons for 
uh, my RIP software, my Photoshop. Uh, Bridge is another little thing that we'll kind of touch on as a, an exploratory uh, program. So it gives you like icons of all your different graphics in one place. But we'll do that later on in more of an advanced class for the um, uh, for the uh, uh, Photoshop class. To get to the update file, just to kind of show you from scratch here, we did have a uh, question from one of the attendees here. To get to it, you just go to your start menu, all apps, or all programs, and scroll down to your RIPRO folder, and there is the update DPD RIPRO C6 in series. Okay. So now I'll go, anytime you do an uninstall or reinstall, it's going to be like you did a fresh install from scratch. So you'll get this little screen when it first pops up, first time setup. All right, and then you have what measurements of display, uh, the numeral places, stuff like that. I just leave these alone. All right. Next, it'll come up, you just kind of go through self-explanatory stuff. Uh, once you get to this screen right here, we have to choose the printer that we're installing. All right, once we come here, these are all the different printers that we've sold over time. All right, for the M series, you'll notice that there's a couple of them here. You have the M4. Unless you own an M4, do not download these. All right, then you have two versions of the M series the M series normal and the M series P30i. This is a new one that just came out probably about mid-year or so. But I've also had a lot of complaints on vibrancy issues. Uh, things where the, the samples, like say you got from your salesperson, are not as vibrant as the ones that are coming off your printer. The reason being for that is these have uh, lesser of a print mode for the color modes and things. Um, and for right now, until I get with the actual programmer, I just as a suggestion from a tech, I would use just the regular M series um, Qs here, not the P30i. And that's my personal opinion. All right, so I'm going to install just the regular Qs here. And it doesn't matter if I'm using the genuine, um, uh, the genuine DTG ink, which is uh, the DuPont Artisans, or the P30i inks that are exclusive to Cool Desi. So, these are uh, just to your preference. You can download both of them, so you can have both sets of cues if you want. So, but it's totally up to you. But I, for this webinar, I'm just going to use the M series here to, and then go through and optimize them as well. All right, so I click OK. I always search the online server for the best packaging. come up and give me three green check marks when it's done and that's the initial installation so click finish software will open up and this is my rip software okay so what I'm going to do is get this kind of prepped up um, and make it just a little bit more efficient to use uh, so that way it's clean it's um, uh, like kind of step-by-step -step type of thing so I don't have to look around for things. I don't have to click through a whole bunch of different platins. Like it installs like M4 platins here. I can get rid of those. Let's go through and uh, take a look at that. So what I'll do is just close my RIP software down. I'm going to go to my file locator again. Go to my hard drive, C drive, and I'm going to double click on the DTG RIP Pro M series. So inside here, after I uh, optimize my queues and stuff like that, I can even make a backup of this folder right here, my queues folder. So that way, if I do go through an uninstall and reinstall process, I can reinstall these queues just by uh, copying and pasting them in here. Same thing with that media file that I did before. But under the media file, what I'm going to do is get rid of a lot of these platins that I don't need, like the M4s and stuff like that. You notice there's a whole bunch of different ones in here, but these are just uh, like driver information. This just comes with uh, basic printer, motherboards, and things like that. So we just leave those alone. So what I'll do is get rid of the M4s. I can hold the control key and do multiple selections. Just hit delete. Um, I can rename these any way I want. All right. I can even get rid of these bigger ones if I need it as well. 
But the ones that'll pop up in the rip software, like we saw earlier, are just these main uh, top ones. But I didn't want the M4 in there. All right, so I'll just close that down, reopen my rip software. So that way, when I click back on my platens here, those M4 ones are no longer in there. Okay. <coughs> Next, we're going to talk about just the basic layout here of the RIP software. Over here in this window, you notice that these are your platens. All right. Uh, it's basically just a preview screen. So right now, it's set up to the uh, four up toddler prints. Normally, I don't use that unless I have a specialty uh, like order or something to that. So I'm just going to click over here on two up. You notice that the template screen changed. Let me see if I can stretch this window out to make it a little bit bigger here. Okay. So then from here, I can look at my preview screen. I can always minus these out. So I can queue up jobs like in advance. So say I'm the, uh, the graphic designer or the uh, owner operator and I'm uh, lining up my day's work. I can go ahead and import these jobs directly in here and I can queue these up for, say, an employee. Totally up to you the way you use your RIP software. Okay. All right. So looking at this, um, just so you can get the orientation, this is this front corner of the machine. As if you were standing up here at the front of the machine, this is where you would stand. This down here would be the back of your machine. All right. So this would be the corner, if I'm standing at the front of the machine, this would be the side, this particular platen area would be on the right hand side. Uh, my print head carriage would be docked over here and my control panel would be over here on this side. It's basically printing upside down. Because you've got to think, back in the day when this, before this printer was converted over to print t-shirts, it was probably a roll printer. So the roll of paper is coming through the back of the machine and ejecting out of the front. So just kind of keep that in mind. All right, over here is your incoming jobs before they've been processed, after they've been processed, and everything like that. Once they have been printed, they drop down here to the reserve. My reserve, if I have it set up properly, I, if I have a second shirt, I don't have to process it again, speeding up my production time. Down here are my options. I always choose my platen system before I import the job into the RIP because uh, uh, if I don't, then it will, like if I had two up same and only have one shirt to print, it would print over here in midair because it does not, there's no eyeballs on your machine to tell you whether the shirt's in there or not. You have to tell the machine and the software what you want it to do. Okay. Over here, margins, these always stay zero. These will move these platens around and stuff, and you'll be offset printing. It's a pain in the butt to get it back to where it needs to be. All right. Next is you can control different aspects of your underbase or your color layer. Those aspects of being, am I printing in bidirectional mode versus unidirectional mode? Unidirectional is off. Bidirectional is on. What bidirectional printing? As the print head slides across, it's laying ink down. Bidirectional is laying ink on the way back as well. All right. With that in mind, these have there's drag of that ink behind the uh, print head, so those little drag lines have to match up to each other, so that way you don't have what we call bidirectional blur. That deals with the gap of the machine, those little load lasers, and how close the shirt is to the print head. Can't be touching it because it will have clogged print heads, but it can't be too far away or you'll have blurry print. Um, once we have those, we can actually, if you are noticing that you have blurry prints or something to that order, um, you can actually take pictures of those and email those to your with your support ticket. So that way the technicians can look at them and give you suggestions, whether it be leveling your platens, um, adjusting your gap or adjusting your artwork. So there's all a couple different things that you can do to make these adjustments, but you, if you don't do the adjustments in the proper order, you can, it's self-defeating because if one's out of whack and then you try to adjust to something that's out of whack, then both of them are out of whack, if that makes sense. Okay, 
The next thing down is your passes. And this is basically how many times the printhead tracks over itself before the platen advances to do the next line of ink. All right. For the underbase, the default is two. If you're having issues with your underbase, like dropping ink down in the wrong places or something like that, bumping that up to three can, uh, can help you out as well. But it also slows down your underbase passes. All right. Your color is always set for three. So that way it has nice, good coverage. All right. Return to origin for the M2. It will always stay on. All right. This was here for some of the older equipment, say the Viper or stuff like that, that was on a belt-driven system. So you could make it eject to the back of the machine versus the front. So that will have nothing to do with your uh, M2, but always make sure that it's on. All right, vertical offset. I would not start messing with vertical offset until you get some advice from your support technician. It will only be used uh, if your white underbase is peeking out the every single time to the exact same distance in the exact same location okay because it only affects the north and south of your uh, underbase or your color layer it does not affect the left or right or east or west okay so meaning that if i was on my underbase i can increase like how far it goes away from the zero zero so if my underbase, my white, was peeking out towards the front of the machine, I can actually move that white layer down, but it does it every single print. So if you're not getting consistent uh, peek out every single print you do, do not adjust this, or it will affect everything you do. But if the uh, white layer is below uh, the color layer, then you would have to adjust the color layer instead. Okay. Reason being, you can only push away from the front. You cannot pull from the back, if that makes sense. If you need more clarity on that, or you're having something that you feel that you're having an issue, please create a support ticket and attach pictures with the uh, after the shirt's printed and it's still on the machine. Uh, so that way we can see which way it's peeking out and uh, give you the best advice on how to correct that issue, okay? So that's just the basic layout down here. Up here, you have your uh, different cues. You have your categories versus what the actual cues and the predefined settings underneath that category. You have your basic tool buttons up here, and then you have your drop-down menu. All right, the first one we're going to talk about just go over it, import file, find file, get from Gmail, things like that. The get from Gmail, a lot of people have asked about it. If you want to learn more about that, you can uh, look inside your uh, the Ripro C6 uh, manual, and it will explain that. And basically, you can have it turned on. Uh, I haven't found a real-world use for it yet, um, but that might be something that it, for your business model, it might work. Okay, uh, before I move on, I did get a, a very valid question. Um, is the quality that much better or worse without uh, bi-directional printing? Okay, so bi-directional printing, if you're laying ink down in both swipes of the head, it's going to be quicker than the uh, unidirectional, which lays down ink in one direction of the head movement, and then returning back to home, and then laying ink down, returning back to home. The only reason I would use unidirectional printing is if I had a slightly uneven surface, I mean very slightly uneven, uh, meaning something like a canvas or a piece of wood, something in that really finite detail really comes into play. Um, but it will slow down your printing half the speed as if it was set to bidirectional. So that's why I don't really use unidirectional printing on t-shirts. I would only use that on like non-textiles, things to that order. I hope that uh, explained that question a little bit better. And it just, your, it, what it does, the unidirectional takes out the gap because it's only laying ink down in one direction. So it's a little bit more accurate, but definitely slower. But as long as you have your machine mechanically set up properly, like with the correct gap positioning, uh, the correct uh, 
your platens are all the exact same height uh, to the head, um, then bidirectional crimping will definitely be the way to go. Okay. Also, you can get to like the import files and stuff like that just from these, uh, like the open button, those type things. Um, so those are really self-explanatory. All right, the next one is your cues menus. Um, a new feature that has just been added into the RIP is the setup of these different features right here. What it does, like set up maximum whiting, we'll click on that. It basically will print grids, all right? So you can actually import an image and it will print it smaller so that way, and it will do it in different increments, so that way you can see uh, what level of whiting, like it'll do it at 100%, 90%, 80%, 80%, and so forth, over and over again, and you get to choose from it. It's not to say you have to do this for every image that you want, but it's a way to test stuff before you actually um, print it, so that way you can see what these settings do. So say I wanted to see what the black removal setup. Say I've got an image with a piece of photography on it. It has a black background, but I'm not sure what to set my uh, knock me black out to. Uh, once we get into the actual cue settings, I'll show you how to adjust the knock me black out and try to give you an explanation of what it does. But this gives you a visual of it. So that might be something you want to play around with on your uh, on your own. All right. But also under my queue drop down menu is my manage queues. For that first initial install, I definitely want to come in here and adjust these things. I can move these fields around so I can see what they say just by moving the little uh, in between headers here. All right. Something else you'll want to do is set your ports. Okay. Under ports, I don't have a uh, machine in my webinar room right now, so it does not show my MUTO driver in here. Yours will come up and say MUTO such and such with USB 001, 2, or whatever number it may be. Once you click on that, it will choose and say, do you want to do multiple queues? If you click yes, you notice it populates them all. All right, yours, just go ahead and just so you're seeing it right now, yours will not say printer USB 001. Yours will have MUTO in there. I do not have a, a printer hooked up to this computer right now, so that's why I just put it there. So I'm going to put it back to file just so nobody puts that back where it should be. All right, but if you have it set for file, it'll just come up and say, where do you want to print it to? Uh, what file? So you don't want to do that. You want yours to say the MUTO driver. All right. Also right here, your control panel. You do not want to hit install. What this does uh, is basically install a Windows driver that you'll never use because <laughs> you can't control like what's going to it, what your print field is, what it's going to look like. You don't get any previews. So just don't click on uninstall. If you have, you can always click remove and it takes it away. Um, you have your groups. If you're going to create custom queues and stuff like that, you can group them into certain ones for predefined settings, kind of where they show up, what tabs they show under. Um, if you had multiple printers, all right, if you had two different printers or and things like that, you can even install a separate set of queues if you had two uh, two printers. So you have one set up to one USB and one set up to the other. To make sure to label them properly so that way you when you send the job over it sends it to the correct one all right so what I like to do is I like to move these cues around so they're a little bit uh, easier and kind of like a sequential order so what I'll do is take my bottom one uh, that I want first move it to the top and then the second to the bottom one move it to the top so that way it kind of pushes them down so the white ink only I don't use the most so I'm going to make that one my bottom one and then I will go to my white shirts. Let me scroll down a little bit. So I'm going to do the, the, you've got two or like four different cues that are for each of these predefined settings. You have fast and best uh, with graphics and then fast and best without graphics. The difference between these two, one's a graphics print mode and one's a photo print mode. All right, you can rename these if you want to put photo in between those. It's just kind of redundant. All right, 
The difference between photo and graphics, your photos are for your uh, things with skin tones, all right? Uh, something, because if you use the graphics print mode to print photography that had like a, per, a, a photograph of someone, they look like they have a spray on tan. It oversaturates those colors, all right? So, some, but the only way to really tell it the way it's going to work is to print it, all right? And then as you get further into using the stuff and the way it affects graphics, you'll start to recognize it does similar things every single time you use these cues. So once you notice how a cue works, then you can start choosing and you can look at your graphics from the get-go and be like, okay, I need to use this cue for this because I know it's going to do this if I use this cue. All right, so let me move these up here. Get my white ones up first. And you notice that I'm doing the, uh, so the way it comes in, just so you can see it, I'm pushing up to the top. So I did my white ink only, then I did fast, 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 fast. So that way I'm putting them in a sequential order so they're easy to understand. So that way I'll have color down here and color down there. It's just personal preference. black ones are last. All right, so now they're all grouped together. They're all in sequential order, uh, best of fast, best of fast, and so forth. So that way they're easy to get, uh, navigate around and kind of easy to uh, um, get to when I need to. All right. So then I'm going to go through and I can make sure to uh, optimize these cues so that way I have the optimum setting. There are a few things uh, that I have to get with the uh, software programmer to make sure that the install is, uh, it just comes in as the default. Uh, the reason it's not already there now is because we go through and test this stuff. Um, and this is just over time, once we find out what we want to change, then we go to the programmer and be like, all right, can you make it look like this? So it still functions the exact same as if I didn't do all this. I just do this to make it a little bit cleaner looking. Okay. So then I'm going to go through and check out my cue properties. All right. Before I go into the actual properties here, you have those three, three main categories, your black shirts, your color shirts, and your white shirts. Am I limited to printing black shirts only in my black shirt queue? No. This is just the name of these categories, just to give you a help, okay? Your machine and your software have no eyeballs on it. So if I had a blue shirt and I printed in the black shirt queue, is it still going to print it? Yes. The only thing that's, that these do right here is they're predefined settings. All right, so the difference between these my white ink only, what it does is take a graphic and print the graphic in just white ink. All right, so sometimes I might have to invert it. And we'll come back to the white ink only so I can explain that a little bit more thoroughly, uh, but that is a useful tool. But you have to sit your artwork up properly so that way it does it properly. The white shirt cues basically turn off the side of the print head that prints with white ink. All right, and it only prints with a CMYK, no underbase. So that, instead of it being a white shirt uh, name, I could call it no underbase, because that's basically what it does. So regardless of what color shirt I put in there, it's going to print it with no white ink. All right, so to give you an example, if I wanted to print uh, navy blue to a baby blue shirt, print it. No underbase. The blue will be a little bit darker on the shirt because it's mixing with the blue of the shirt. Same thing if I wanted to say print red to a pink shirt. All right. You notice these are corresponding colors. Say I wanted to print royal blue to a yellow shirt. Those are not corresponding colors because they mix together and then I would have green lettering. All right. So you got to think about corresponding colors or not. Um, it's just basic color theory. Like you have your primary colors, which are your red, blue, and yellow. 
and then you mix two of those together and it gives you your secondary color and so forth. So it's just some of those uh, color theory type things to kind of keep an eye on. But to say if I did want to print royal blue to a yellow shirt, then I would have to use either one of my underbasing uh, cues, which would either be my color shirt cues or my black shirt cues. Now the color shirt cues, the thing that you have to worry about on those is your graphic has to be on a transparency. It cannot be a flattened image. It cannot have a background. Because if it does, then it will print a big rectangular box of white ink. Yeah, might look neat. Might look like a big square of white ink around your image. Probably not desirable. The customer might not like that. So getting rid of backgrounds and things, that's where your graphic software comes into play. Um, the graphic softwares that are kind of the staples in the industry right now, you've got your Adobe products, which are Photoshop and Illustrator. Um, then you have Corel. Corel is a, uh, a little bit cheaper of a program out there, but it is a vector-based program. It doesn't really handle, say, JPEGs and bitmaps very well. You have to recreate those or trace them to or create from scratch. Um, whereas Photoshop is a raster-based program. Uh, where you can actually just delete the pixels. So if you want more descriptions of that, once we get into the webinar, keep an eye on it. I haven't got an actual date for it, but we go through and explain uh, Photoshop and uh, things like that and printing from Photoshop. All right. So the main stipulation with the color graphics or, uh, or the color uh, cues is the you have to have a transparent background or no background at all uh, for that to print properly. The black shirt cues uh, has a feature turned on it. It's the exact same as the color shirt cue, except for this one feature, and it's called Knock Me Blackout. And that's why they're called black shirt cues, uh, because it knocks the black of your graphic out, so that way it uses the black of the shirt to be the black of your design. All right. The also, on an artist level, or a graphic designer level, that gives you the ability to design onto a black background. Um, more advanced descriptions of that, of why that makes it uh, better. And it's not really better, it's just a technique where it blends like semi-opaque pixels, such as like a fade or a smoke, into the black background, changing its color and helping it blend better. So. Depend, depending on what your graphic look like, what your graphic looks like, um, if you want black, black to print in the design or not, if your graphic doesn't have black in the design and you're, say, printing a green shirt, but you also have smoke on the edge or real faded edge, um, you can actually put your graphic onto a black background and put it into the black shirt cues, so that way it gives that effect. But it doesn't destroy the graphic or make it look weird on, say, the green shirt, right? So they're just predefined settings for, and you've got to choose like the different aspects of your graphic to which cue you want it to go into. And for beginners and stuff like that, um, you can always email a copy uh, or like a screenshot of your graphic and be like, and just shoot a question and be like. What what I'm printing to a such and such shirt. Um, this is the graphic they gave me. What do you think I should use to do this? How would you do that? And you can ask your support technicians and stuff like that. Now those questions might be pushed back a little bit further in the queue system, uh, based on like people who are having machine issues. We definitely try to take care of the people that are down um, and not being able to print before we go into just like basic graphic questions. You can also, if you have the email addresses to like technicians or something like that, you can shoot those and they can get back to you at your leisure. All right, so let's go into the actual individual properties of one of these cues. Now, I can either get to those by double clicking on the cue tab up here at the top, or if I'm in my cue manager, I can hit the little button with the three, but, uh, three dots in it, which says cue properties. Once I get into that, this is my properties button. You have all kinds of general settings in here. 
All right, just to go through them a little bit, like general, this is where I could rename it. All right, uh, never change the location or the printer type or anything. Uh, the substrate cone, a lot of people get confused with this. This is just the background of your preview screen. And yes, I will touch on job costing, so it's pretty simple to set that up. Uh, but going back here to the substrate color, uh, the substrate color is basically just the background of your preview screen. All right? That's why I chose black for my black shirt queue and uh, gray for my color shirt queue. Because if I had a white background on there, then I wouldn't be able to see my white ink. That type of thing. Because those two cues print with white ink. Now on my white shirt queue, the background's white. This has no output or, or no bearing on the output of the way your shirt prints. So this is just for the preview screen over here. So that's why I just leave those alone. All right, next down is hot folders. What hot folders do is if you have multiple graphics designers and stuff like that, you can enable hot folders where you already have predefined settings set up. This is more of an advanced thing. Uh, if you have multiple machines, multiple graphic artists and stuff like that. We can, uh, there are instructions of how to set those things up within the RIP help folders. Uh, you can get from your, uh, and you can get from the help menu or you can get it from the actual RIP Pro manual. But 98% of BTG users don't need to use that. All right, media setup, always leave this alone. This is just the basic settings for general settings for your printer. I always kind of leave them uh, uh, the general defaults here. Uh, printer status, job reserve. If this is not checked, um, then you probably want to have it checked. What that means is once I rip something and I've already printed it, it'll drop it down here to my reserve. If I did not have save spool file on the job reserve, what that would mean, every time I want to do a second set of shirts, I would have to re-rip it which slows down production. Time is money in this industry. The quicker you can get stuff on and off your machine, the quicker you're going to have money in your pocket. All right. Next, crop marks. We'll never be using crop marks. You might ask yourself, why is this even in here? Um, this, is, this is an OEM rip. It runs several different types of equipment. All right. We just have individual drivers that we're using for our rip. So some of these features in here you won't use, but just don't use them if they don't have, apply to you. All right, under print mode overrides, your printer options. These are not enabled when you're in a layered uh, um, uh, profile or a queue. Same thing with like ICC profiles, half tones, stuff like that. Um, unless you are really good with ink color systems and know how to do profiling, don't mess with this stuff. Even if you get into the actual print modes and things like that. Once you start tweaking stuff and thinking it's going to do this to try it, you're going to mess it up. So if you need to get into a higher level stuff like that, if you have that information and you know what you're doing, please, by all means, go through it. Um, there is in the RIP Pro C6 manual that you can download on our website. There will be some more uh, in intricate discussions on this or uh, explanations on what it is. So take a look at it if you want. All right, the next is your layer profiles. This is what I do use a lot when it comes to my um, uh, setting up my RIP software. These are where all your settings are. Looking at this screen right here, you, can, you have an underbase and a color mode. All right, and then you have the mode, the print mode that is selected for each one of those, okay? I can add different layers. I can take layers away. I can rename them if I want to, but generally for a dark shirt, you have an underbase and then you have color. For a white shirt, it would only be color. And we don't even have layers enabled for the, uh, for the white shirts. All right. So looking at here, I want to know what my options are. So show processing options. So this is where all my actual RIP settings are, where the way it's going to actually print. Over here, the default for when it gets installed, the maximum ink is set at 90%. All right, so it's going to be 90% of its capability for the M2. If your white ink is not printing nice and thick, two things. You either have this setting too low, or you do not have enough pre-treat on your shirt. 
Um, that's assuming that you have a good knowledge check. Then you got to go through, am I having wheat starvation? Am I, is my current head clogged? Those types of things. But if you want just a little bit more ink to come out, you can bump this up to 100%. All right. Looking over here, these are my underbase options. If I have none, that means there's no underbase. There's no option. If I want to change my underbase, then I have my underbase options. And I have highlights as well. You can't really print highlights during an underbase. What a highlight is, is printing white ink during the color palette. We'll come back to that in a second. All right, so under base strength. A lot of people will think this is how much white ink comes out of my system. Technically, yes, it does control the amount of white that comes out, but it's not how you control the actual percentage of ink that comes out. That's the max ink percentage. What the under base strength is, is how it affects white ink under dark colors. All right, so self-explanatory, 0% uh, white underneath black. Well, we're not printing black ink in this cube because it's the one that has the knock me blackout turned on. So, but if it's just lower than the color black, it's not a true black, say like it's a forest green or a navy blue, those darker colors, then it prints just percentages of ink underneath them. But if you want a just a solid white underbase underneath something, turn it under 100% white under black. Right? So for the default, for the black shirts, I just leave that at 19 or 0%. Maximum ink, if I want it to see how good or capable it is, I'll turn it up to a 100. If that's printing too much white ink, it's puddling, and your uh, color ink is going onto it too quickly, then it can uh, bleed or kind of smear out or something to that order. That's when I would drum this back down to like 90 or even 85. Or say I'm doing a left chest logo. I want, it, I want that 100% ink, but it's um, putting too much white ink down in too quick a time, and it's not the white ink is not congealing over. So yeah, I'll drum that down to maybe 90%, so that way it prints a little bit less white ink, but still puts the color on top of it. Time. Next is you have your choke. What choke does is it actually shaves off the edge or the pixels at the edge of your underbase. So that way, when the color goes on top of it, it's tucked up underneath the color. So that way, I don't have white peeking out. Now, this is on a pixel level. All right? This is not like if you have a millimeter or so sticking out, this is not what you're going to use to fix that. The kind of sweet spot that I found is around five. All right? You can get lower, so be it. It's not going to really make your prints look any better. But if you do go over 10, if you have little lettering, it will actually shave away so much white that the underbase underneath that lettering will go away, but it will still print the color on top of it. You never really go above 10. All right. Then you have your knock me blackout settings. All right. Knock me blackout. Is only threshold. Just to kind of give you an example here, I'm gonna show you like I'm gonna get y'all to use your imaginations a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is create um, like a way to look at this as if it was an underbase. Print. Like if I'm going to have my screen here is going to be my shirt, like on the platform. So let's see. Let's just go. Let's just open up something random here. Take pictures. We'll just use this as an example. Let me change this around a little bit so that way y'all can see it a little bit better. So what that checkerboard represents is the transparency. All right, so that way uh, it represents no ink. All right, so let's make this into a um, like an underbase because that's what the not me black is. It, it affects the underbase. So let's see. I'm gonna make this look like my platen here. Three point five one. 
as it's called. Okay, so imagine this is my plaque. All right, let me move this off a little bit. I'm going to create a, another layer of black. Go back over to this layer. What is this layer? Now I have my background, which is my t-shirt will be black. Then I'm going to make this look like a white layer. So I'm just going to desaturate it. Okay, so this is the way my white layer would look if I printed it. Okay? So what the Not Me Blackout does, it's basically like a brightness slider for your underbase. And it actually controls the amount of white ink, uh, the way it prints it. So if I took my Not Me Blackout and slid it lower, watch what it does to the white layer. It prints less white ink underneath the darker color. In turn, if my Not Me Blackout slider is higher, it floods it to the point where it might be too much white ink underneath it. So we found our sweet spot is around that 74, which will print enough white ink under the darker colors and a lot of white ink under the lighter colors. Okay? So that's what Not Me Blackout is doing. There's that slider bar. So 75, all the samples that we do here are ran at the default. So if I want a little bit more, if I want it to knock out less black, I make this number higher. I want to knock out more black, I make it lower. All right. Any questions on this so far? All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to go over, uh, just so I can click on it so you see it, primary and clear options. You'll never use this stuff. Um, if you're a really good graphic artist and you know how to create alpha channels and work with channels in general, Look in the RIP Pro C6 manual to look up information on alpha channels. My skill level isn't even as good as that. I'm still teaching myself how to create type things. But what this will do is be able to give you the ability to create your own custom underbases uh, before you even send it over to the print. So, but definitely read up on that. And uh, if it comes down to it, you really are an advanced user and you know how to create alpha channels and stuff like that then I might be able to get you in touch with a programmer if necessary. All right, clear options. This will never be used with the BPD. This is for other printers. Okay. So the only thing I really changed in my, in looking in the queue that I was in, the black graphics best, was I clicked on my layer profiles. I changed my max ink to 100%. All right, I'll verify that my color layer is turned on. All right, then I can look at the options here. You notice that I have white turned on during the color pass, right? That's a highlight, all right? What highlights do is basically print a little bit of whiting during the color pass. But white's technically not a color, all right? That's why we have to have a rip software in the first place. The What the RIP software does is actually give the ability to print the color white. And touching back on it, the white is being technically not a color. It doesn't mix with other colors to make new colors, sort of like your primary colors do, or the red, uh, yellow, and blue. All right? So that's why we only do it at like very small percentages. So that way it just hits those visibly white areas with a little bit of white ink, just to make them pop just a little bit more. Right? And it takes uh, kind of like a, a just an eye uh, to figure out because every there is no blanket setting for every type of graphic that this setting will work for. This is where that learning curve comes in that you just kind of have to print to see how your artwork is affected with these settings and then make adjusting adjustments accordingly. 
Okay, so now I'm just going to click OK on this. And then I'm going to go back over here to my fast. I don't think there's anything I need to change in here, but I'm just going to go through and check real quick. Alright, see all my chokes there, my inks there, the inks there, color layer is the correct one. You notice that the uh, versus the best and the fast is your print modes that change. The best one was 1440 by 720, whereas the fast ones are 720 by 720. Um, it's how fast it prints. 720 prints with less ink, whereas uh, but faster. Whereas the quality prints at a higher resolution, which prints out more ink, but slower. So who's to say which one's better? Your customer is, not you. All right, that might be throwing y'all for a loop right now. All right, we print on a daily basis. We are our own worst critics. All right, the customer has no clue about these settings. They have no clue what you went through to make it, how many shirts you wasted or anything like that. All that they care about is their final product. All right, one of the cool things about direct garment printing, it gives you the ability to print one. You know what that is? That is your proof or your sample. So if you have finicky customers, print them off the sample. If you can use the fast mode and it prints nice and beautiful, Put it in front of them. Yeah, you know in your own head that you can make it look more vibrant, more ink down, and stuff like that. But who cares? It's your customer's opinion that matters. So if you can print something faster with less ink, you can get on to the next job, which is going to put more money in your pocket. So give a sample to your customer in the fast mode and see what they say. Well, can we make it a little bit more vibrant? Sure. I have uh, an ability to increase the levels of ink on it, but that will also cost you a dollar more. It's called an upcharge. <laughs> so, just keep that in mind. We are our own worst critics. Sometimes you can print this stuff, put it in front of your customers, and if they say, wow, run with it. Cool. So, just test those things out. But, yeah, if you're using your fast modes, you definitely have to have your pre-treatments correctly or it just doesn't look good. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. All right, so the difference between those before, one is the graphics print mode, one is the uh, photo mode, so the ones without graphics. So the fast ones already pre knows it. Uh, I don't need to change anything. The best are the ones that I do change to max ink percentages. So I'll zip through this a little bit just to verify. That's fine. Click OK. So fast, I don't need to change anything from there. So the only two I've changed so far is just the max ink percentages for graphics best and black best. Now the color modes, I will change something in all four of these. Uh, this is something that I've found through working with the different ink companies and stuff like that. But I do have to change some of these settings uh, so that way I get the best uh, washability and stuff like that. All right, so right now I'm in my color graphics best. All right, the things that I change in there, just like I did before with the other ones, change that up to 100. But I do notice that I do print black ink. All right, so the not me blackout is unchecked. And going back to that explanation, the difference between the two is with the color cues, I have to have a transparency, no background. Uh, the black cues, I can have a black background. That's pretty much the only difference there. All right. The way the ink system works, the colored ink is not designed to go on the dark garment pretreatment. Right? It won't bond with the fabric as well. That's why there, for the P30Is, there's a light on the pretreatment. Right? So if I am putting the dark garment pretreat, no matter what color shirt it is, and I'm using white ink, if I just put color ink on top of that pretreatment, it will not bond with the fabric properly, and you will have washout quicker than the rest of the design that does have white ink. So for my color shirt print modes, I like to put a little bit of white ink underneath my dark colors, including black. All right, black being the darkest color. 
So that ensures that when my color ink goes down onto that white ink, it will bond. The color ink is designed to bond with the white ink. The color ink is not designed to bond with the dark garment tree tree. I hope that makes sense. All right, so the next ones, even though they're not in here, I'm going to put all my chokes at five, just because I know that they print well out of my black cues. So this is where I kind of find my sweet spot. And I don't see any uh, image degradation or anything like that, even if I'm doing small letters. All right, so the things that I'm changing in my color cue here. I change my underbase straight. Um, if it is printing too much white ink underneath your black and kind of making it gray looking, make it to a smaller number, but you do need at least a little bit of white ink underneath every color pixel. All right. One more color layer. There's nothing I change there. So the only things I change, once again, are my underbase strength. I take it up to 50% under white. Like I said, if you want a little bit less white ink, you can choose one of the other numbers. Just something above uh, 20 or above. I changed my max ink from my best one to 100%. Like I said, if the white ink is printing too much out of that, then you might want to make that smaller. All right, choke. I just put it up to five because I know it's going to work. You can test that out um, anytime you want. All right. If you are doing testing and you change some of these key properties, for them to, to take effect to the graphic that's in your queue, you have to re-import it. If you printed something and ripped it, it locks in those settings of that particular job. You would have to re-import your graphic again for the new settings to take place. Always remember that. So, I'm going to do my strength up to 50%. Already at 100, change this to a 5. All right, nothing to change there. So now I've got these to do. The color without graphics. Same exact thing. Once you've done this a couple times, it goes really fast. So you notice these are the photo modes. Okay. Grab those done. Now the last one, <clears throat> now the last ones I have to change here are my white shirt modes. The only two, the defaults for my fast ones are perfectly fine. Just so you can see them, 720 by 720, which is my speed modes, white shirt graphic. That's fine. Now the programmer has made a little mistake here, so that's why I always go through and make sure people are putting this under the right ones. This is 720 by 720 with underbase graphics. So that is completely the wrong print mode for white shirts, because <laughs> it's not an underbase print. So what I have to do to change that is go in here. Since I'm working with my white shirt graphics, white shirt graphics, that's what it should be. So then I have to just click OK. Also, you'll notice that I have no layer profile because they're not enabled. They don't need to be enabled because it's no layers. It's just one single shirt. All right. So the other one, I do have to change the white vest. But instead of the white shirt graphics, it needs to be white shirt photos. All right, so then I click OK. So that's the basic optimization of our RIP Pro cues. All right. So I can click close here. Some of the other stuff I can show you. Let's see. So under the queue drop menu, if I have uh, if I have hot folders, I can start queues, stop queues, because the only way those really work um, 
I really don't even mess with this because I'm basically printing one run at a time because the machine does not automatically reroute. Um, I can probably write up something on those changes. Uh, I know I'm going to be doing an actual voice overlay of the installation. Um, I'm hoping instead of going through that stuff, I can actually take over your computer and set these up for you. Uh, but a, uh, I'm going to try to send this information over to my programmer so that way it installs like this anyway. But if you've already got it installed and you need some help getting these settings proper, just create a support ticket and, uh, and the subject line can be help with optimizing the RIP settings. Okay. All right. Let's see, under job here. Um, restore job is basically if I've archived something. Uh, say I have something that I know that I'm going to be printing uh, over and over again, like a school logo or something like that. Uh, and it's always going to be in the same position, same colors, uh, same so or same place down on the shirt, things like that. After I've printed it, it's all proved, I know that's going to be the job. And then I can click on archive job. It's this little button right here, and it puts it into an archive folder. Uh, when you click on restore job, then it comes up and says what job you want to restore. Choose that job, it brings it back into the RIP, and then you just hit print. And it's the exact same print job that you did before. Some people never use it. You don't have to. It's totally personal preference of the way you use these tools to get your jobs done. Other things, uh, remove, okay, so those are all the same buttons that are on uh, up here on the toolbar here. Under device, you have manage devices. So if I had different types of printers, say an M-series and an old Viper, I would have both of those devices there. You can always come in here and check for updates from the printer packages. If you click on it, check the web for updates. It'll either say, it'll either download them and upgrade you, or it will say no new device packages are ready. Since I did a fresh install, I know that this is the most current. All right, many print modes. You can mess up your print modes really bad if you don't know what to do with these. All right, say I'm in my underbase. You know what separation curves are and how they affect stuff. I would not mess with these if you do not. Because you can really tweak these things out. Um, as I mean, uh, like people may ask me, like, when do you change these things? That's the point. I don't. I know that the printer works the way it is. That's why I went through. Me and the other technicians here have gone through and printed over and over and over again to the point where we have the software guy here, and we've gotten it to a point where we know that it prints proper. Okay? There's very minor tweaks that I do to change things. Like, like the only time I make tweaks to this type of stuff is if um, there's something major going on. But usually you can correct uh, all your print issues just with either mechanical fixes or just a simple tweak in your graphics software. All right? Because if I change any of this stuff in here, I can't see what it's going to do to my graphics. And then if I don't remember which tweak I did, then you can just mess up the rip all together. All right, other things, your print medium, all right, so these are your actual platens, all right, let's double click on one. So this is my template, if I want to make changes here, if I click on one, this is the positioning of it. So if it's a little bit further this way, if you're not printing centered, you can actually print a square and then zero, zero here and see how far off it is and then you can make adjustments to the positioning. This is how far over this box is from this side. This is how far down it is from this side. This is the actual size of the platen. So you can, if you want to be intricate, you can sit there and change these all around. All right, you notice this is template one, this is template two. So if I was in my two up same, template one and template one. So that way when I import a, a job into one, it populates both of them, and so forth. 
You can create custom flattened if you want, custom simple. All up to you. If you have a specific flatten that you've ordered or have one, then we can send you a template or you can create your own. You can even make a copy of this existing one and just change those to the size that, that it is. Other stuff, print test pages. What that is, is just give you little test pages. I mean, they're just there for your use. All right, if you want to get to something, you know how it says 24 pages of printouts, you're welcome to print each one of those, but unless you print 24 t-shirts, <laughs> that's up to you. But you can, uh, if you have real nitpicky customers with like Pantone colors and stuff like that, these are not Pantone printers. They are CMYK printers, process printers. So sometimes you might have to print out swatches for people to use. An easier way than doing it through there because you can't really control it that much is I can go to my computer. I can find the DTG RIP folder. There's my CMYK and RGB color swatches. So I can actually print these things out to a shirt. And then if somebody wants a specific color, I can hold that whatever brochure, business card, or whatever up to these and put those values in. All right. Under options, I can change my previewing. I never really mess with this stuff right here, unless you don't want the splash screen to come up. <laughs> Little things like that. The, the defaults work fine. They don't really affect the output of the printing. Right? But I do like to change my preview options. If I have a faster computer and a good graphics card and stuff like that, my preview can look very similar to my uh, file that I'm putting in there. But always take an effect, always take an account, this is a preview screen. This has nothing to do with the actual output of the printer. Right? The only thing I usually use my preview screen to, as a telltale is if I'm, say, in the black or my color shirt queue and I have a big white box around my graphic, I'm not going to hit print because it's going to print a big white box around my graphic. That's what I'm paying attention to when I'm looking at my previews. Okay. Direct to port. Just so I can explain what that is. It's a diagnostic tool for your technicians. Say you're having print quality issues. Uh, you can send the print job over um, and it prints it all a certain way. So what I can do is I can take that same graphic, process it through my rich software here, send you a PRN file, and you can drop it into direct to port. And it bypasses your RIP software and uses my RIP settings to print it out. So if mine looks better than yours using, the, uh, using your printer, then we know that it's not your printer that's messing up. All right? If the, and vice versa. And I can also sit there and uh, have you send me your PRN file, and I can print it here to see what's going on. And just to make sure you know, I will not make fun of any kind of graphics or printouts or anything like that. Right? We at least wait to hang up. <laughs> All right? You can always get into your help topics here. Uh, help topics just go into different subjects. It's a good idea to read this stuff. You can actually print out this entire manual. Uh, there is a uh, um, a more clear-cut manual that's not just individual pieces uh, that you can go in and download from our support site. Okay. Remote support, that's used just for the programmer and stuff. We're getting a hold of the program to do this. Uh, we're just in the process of purchasing it. It goes into like TeamViewer, but there's a specific way that they've downloaded theirs uh, for CadLink, which is the actual software manufacturer. But that's for linking up. We do use TeamViewer 11 uh, here as well. Uh, so that way we can go through and uh, take over your computer, upload files, um, see what your screen looks like, um, change your default settings, those types of things. All right.
Next, we'll touch on the writing only. All right. So this is a fun one to try to explain, but it, um, but basically it is using those four white channels as CMYK. But your printer does not see white. So you're basically our RIP software is tricking it. So remember how it did the in Photoshop the uh, the white ink only here. So let's back this out. And we're going to import this into our RIP software, that same image. Let's see, pictures. All right, so it'll come in as a preview. All right, you notice I have a big white box around this thing right now. All right, meaning it's going to print a big white box. All right, but if I right click on it and go down to modify, I can hit on invert. Now it's the inversion of that. It's like a negative. You have to think about that. It's white. So everything that's dark needs to be light. Everything that's light needs to be dark. So when you're thinking about light and dark, when it comes to white ink, all right, you got to think about saturation levels. All right, the saturation levels, which color pushes more ink out of the print head? A dark color or a light color? All right, thinking as a printer. All right, so printers think that they print to white paper. All right, so if you're printing the, uh, the color white, it's not going to print anything. But if you're printing a black color to a white piece of paper, it's pushing out C, M, Y, and K, a mixture of all the colors. So on a saturation level, darker colors print more ink than lighter colors. So when we think about... Uh, sending lettering over to the RIP software. So keep in mind, black will be the darkest color. All right. So if I send the color black over to my white ink only queue, it's going to push more white ink out of the head, making it look brighter. See where that kind of gets confusing? <laughs> so you got to think about it on a saturation level. Or you can just come in here, import the image. If you see a big white box around it, you just go to right click on it, go to modify, and uncheck invert or check invert. All right, so hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. Okay, now we have costing. All right, with the updated software, you have a costing button right here on the end. So depending on which queue I'm in, I can set up my costing. All right, they have all of these different pieces in here that. Um, that I can go through and put in values for, like surface treatment, material cost. If you want to set up these, because there's so many different variables, like tax rates and stuff like that, me personally on a printer level, I just want to know what the ink cost is. I can figure out the, the, uh, the labor cost, all that stuff after the fact. All right, depending on what you purchase your meters at, and if you're purchasing cartridges or whatever, or I'm sorry, uh, for the M2, you're purchasing it by the 8-ounce bottle, by the liter, by the gallon, whatever it may be. You need to break down those numbers to um, to whatever the liter cost is. All right? So that way it gives you an accurate reading. All right. So, yeah, let's just to give you uh, an example here. Let's pull this in. I'm going to just pre-rip it. So that way I'm not going to try to print it. And then I can slide my little slider bar down here, down to the end. It gives me my job cost. So this particular print would cost me 42 cents. All right. You notice if I don't want to slide all this stuff around, watch what I can do. I can right click on this stuff. I can uncheck these things so I don't have all that. I care less about how many pages it is. I can care less if the job is full or not. I can care what time I sent it over. I can care less what substrate it's on. It's using t-shirts all the time. Um, I can care less about the dimensions. I can care less about the number of copies it is. Or what devices I've only got what printer stuck to it. All right, 
I have my port set up already. I can hear less what port it goes to. Print mode, that's not a bad idea to have up there. Or the status of it. I don't know, we'll shoot, let's just turn off that. So that way I've got my job name, the status, page is open, and job call. So you can set it up any way you want. All right, another little tool that a lot of people don't know about is a diagnostic tool called uh, View Raw Data. Under View Raw Data, this just basically gives you a representation of what the process output is going to be. It's like a dot per dot ratio. So let's click OK here. And what it does is it processes the page. On a level of, I can actually see the dot. So you have this little screen that pops up here, and it gives me my substrate color. If I really want to see what it looks like, I always change the substrate to like a gray, and then click OK. So that way I can really see what the white's going to do. All right, and then I can cut off certain channels. Like this is a white ink only, so that's why you're only seeing white. But let me zoom in here and let me show you what it actually is, what you're looking at here. This is a dot per dot ratio. This is what your printer is printing. Pretty neat to see, but there, what would be a reason to use this? All right. So, say I'm getting, I printed something, and I'm getting little white speckles, like all in random ass areas. All right. Well, let's see if it actually is something that's being processed as white speckles. So, if I looked at the raw view and saw little speckles everywhere, yeah, that means it's in my graphic. But if it's not there, and it's printing that, that may be like I'm having droplets of ink. Maybe I have a leaky print head or something to that order. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, a tool, but it's not to say that you have to use it. Uh, if you see the little tracking bars going down like this, don't try to move stuff around. Uh, this is a hell of a piece of code on a computer level that it will definitely confuse you. So let me show you with what it does to like a color layer. Let's go into the color shirt mode. Import that same DTG logo, which has color in it. I will right click and set it. I could either hit uh, spool job or rip only. Same thing. Once it's been processed, then I can go into my raw view. Click OK. Now, this does not give me accurate color representation, but it does give me uh, the way it looked, uh, or the, the dots and stuff like that. So if I noticed there, if I printed it, um, and there was no, uh, uh, I noticed there was a white edge around everything, yeah, then I would come in here to my raw view and I look at it, yeah, there is a little white edge around everything. Cool. All right, well, let's see what it looks like without the color on. So this is my underbase. If I uncheck this, that's just my underbase. So it's printing a solid white under every color except for that black going around. All right. Say I want to look at it as my color layer, but I want to see what the it looks like without the white layer. Oops, did I double click it? So this is just the color layer. So let's see without yellow, what does it print? Or without the cyan? Or without black? So this is what the magenta channel would look like. This is what how much cyan I'm printing. Or how much yellow I'm printing. So you notice there's a little bit of every color in all this stuff. So those are my accents, things like that. Just a diagnostic tool it has no bearing on the output of your uh, printer. It's just to see what's literally printing. Okay, so are there any questions as of right now uh, about understanding your RIP software? Let me bring up my little question field here. Let's see what we got. So going back over, um, once I think you update your software, like the first question is just sparing uh, colors that aren't very vibrant, uh, dried out. 
They have gone through and optimized their pre-treat, the um, making sure that the fibers mat down, so they got the physicality of the actual shirt out of the way, but the prints just aren't coming out as vibrant. I think if you were using, say, the P30i cues, uh, and then actually went through the uninstall and uh, reinstall process using the cues that we did this morning, that you'll get a lot of better results. Okay, if you're still having, say, something like bidirectional blur where like a skinny line is printing two instead of one, I would definitely get on the phone with one of your support technicians and uh, we'll get a couple pictures, a couple test prints and stuff like that. And then we'll go through the process of getting you to adjust your platen levels, your gap settings, your lasers and stuff like that. All right. We answered the questions about the bidirectional. We touched on job costing. All right. Is there any serious following it and it makes a huge difference? All right. So it looks like one of our customers in here, Randy, um, went through and updated the process and is stating that just using the M-Series versus the M-Series P30i has made a huge difference on the output of its quality. So, if you have any questions on this stuff, definitely don't hesitate to get in touch with a couple of the technicians here and uh, we can definitely answer some questions for you. Okay. So this demo definitely went over time but I hope that doesn't, hope that didn't uh, upset anyone. <laughs> but yeah, I did record this one, so I'm going to go ahead and hit stop as of right now. Um, uh, but before we do that, let's go ahead and um, I'm just going to touch on some other stuff of where you can find some of this information. Um, if you want to know about future webinars, uh, you can always come to caswebinars.com. Uh, from their homepage, uh, it has a bunch of different information, even about some of our other products like uh, embroidery, spangle, rhinestones, uh, things like that. You can always click on the tips and training calendar, and it'll have all the different webinars that me and a couple of my colleagues will be doing when it comes to like embroidery, rhinestoning, that type of stuff. Um, if there are particular um, uh, subject that you would like to touch base on, definitely don't hesitate to email me or any of the people here or your salespeople and we can see if we can accommodate to that. Also, just to touch base with creating support tickets. Anytime you have a particular subject, like say under DTG, click on that stuff. But if you can't find the answer inside this information here, down at the very bottom, open a support request. Put in your name. Put as much information as you can in here. Uh, like the callback number, it'll make it an easy enough, or something like a cell phone or something to that order. Add your emails in. Okay. Under subject, put like M2 uh, print quality issues. Then get them a description of what's going on. So that way we can better be have our like pistol loaded with suggestions to give you. Also, a lot of people, if you just go ahead and do this from the get-go, attach your files, like take pictures of the bad prints that you're having and upload them into your ticket so that way we can already take a look at it and just give you a quick answer and then get you back running. Instead of having to be like, all right, you have problems, all right, can you send us pictures of it? And we have to wait for those to email in and then we're going on to another ticket and then coming back to your ticket. So we're just trying to make it a little bit more efficient for you. Okay, so hopefully this was very informative. Um, like I said, if you do have any more specific or very uh, tailored questions or anything like that, don't hesitate to get in touch with uh, any of us. And we will definitely be looking forward to hearing from you.